Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Kushal Bose about the future of learning for the next generation. Kushal Bose, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. It is a pleasure to have you. I'm super excited for this conversation today. We're going to be exploring the future of learning for the next generation. As we think about younger millennials and Gen Z uh, individuals as they enter the labor force, we need to be thinking about how to reskill and upskill our current labor force, but also tap into the unique skills and abilities of this younger generation. So we're going to be unpacking that and exploring how we can go about effective learning and the future of learning. As we get started, I wanted to share Kushal's bio with everybody. Kushal Bose is the CEO of Teledeck, a leader in learning and development for corporate clients to facilitate deep learning, leveraging storytelling, learner engagement, and effectiveness measurement. With advanced degrees in engineering and film production, Kushal founded Teledeck International in 1987 to create engaging training experiences that combine the techniques of cinema to break down complex technical subjects for a variety of corporate audiences. For 35 years, Teledeck has been at the leading edge of innovative training development with an impressive client list of Fortune 500 companies, including Abbott, BP, McDonald's, Philips, Northrop Grumman, uh, Ameritech, Kraft, Cisco, Discover, and many, many more. In 2021, Kushal was awarded as the top global influencer in the field of education by Pike Tail International at the Influencer Summit and is considered by many as a thinker who can connect the dots by bringing together his understanding of it, engineering, music, film, history, and philosophy. Again, it is a pleasure to have you joining me today. Anything else you would like to add by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in further? I think uh, I'll connect my personal background and experience with the topic that as we go forward. Very good, very good. Okay, so as we get started then, uh, let's, well, actually, let's start with a little bit of your background um, and your journey coming from and growing up in India to where you are today. Perhaps that can provide a little bit more context. And then we can get into talking more about deep learning, why deep learning is important, and really what that means for the future of learning for the next generation. All right. Uh, very briefly, uh, I was born in India. My mother was a professional singer. Uh, and my father was an engineer. So right away, right from my family, I inher inherited the right side and the left side of the brain uh, exposure, music and art and literature and cinema from my mother's side and engineering and technology from my father's side. And the school that I went to, the, from grammar school to high school and the graduation, that school provided me with teachers who were amazing uh, musicians, artists, poets. So although I was a student of science, but I read Shakespeare, Byron, Keats, Milton when I was in school in India. Uh, and I was actually a big fan of Western music. And I, I paid my way through college by being a crooner in a Western nightclub in Calcutta. I was, I was singing Harry Belafonte and, uh, and Jim Reeves and Nat King Cole in Calcutta. I, so I grew up in, a, in an Indian society, which was very heavily uh, uh, Westernized. I heard Duke Ellington live in Kolkata, in Calcutta. So you can imagine that 
my uh, familiarity with the Western world was pretty, uh, pretty sophisticated understanding of what, the, what, the, what America was like, what the Western world was like, music, literature, and so forth. But what it also allowed me to do was uh, delve into two different sides of the brain, which is the engineering and technology side and the creative side that uh, put in my heart an yearning for creative uh, endeavors and efforts while due to my father's being in, in the engineering profession, I pursued my engineering degree I, I became a mechanical engineer, and uh, but still I was running my film society in college. I was the president of the music club in college, photography college. I did everything in my college except engineering that I enjoyed and passion. But I, I graduated, and then I started looking for universities to do my masters, and uh, America is where I turned to. And I started, uh, I, I, and I came to America to do my master's. And pretty soon I came, landed in Chicago with Westinghouse Corporation right here in Chicago downtown. And they sent me to nuclear engineering school in Philadelphia and I became a nuclear engineer. But the passion of music and creative and cinema and uh, theater and like literature stayed with me all along. So I was stationed in uh, San Francisco, that's what my Westinghouse, and I was building nuclear power plants in Hawaii and Los Angeles and Sacramento and Palo Alto and Nevada, Arizona, all over the Western coast. Uh, and then uh, suddenly I left it all. I said, my God, I'm turning out to be 40. Uh, my life is ending. Let me reach out to my passion because I believed very early that unless you are passionate about something, uh, you cannot succeed in life. And my passion was, as much as, as it was in engineering, I loved engineering, but I wanted to try out my, uh, my, uh, my creative instincts. So I left uh, California and moved to New York, and I enrolled myself in New York at a master's degree in film and theater in the Department of English. And I graduated at the top of the class, all my, all my student classmates well, they're in team, they're, they were going to get a degree and I was going to get an experience. Uh, so right after that, I started teaching at university, uh, engineering, uh, and I got a chance to come to India, go to India at the invitation of the then prime minister Rajiv Gandhi to really influence the villages and in rural India with technology and storytelling, uh, helping them uh, uh, get motivated to, in, to include technology in their lives in the rural India. So I did that uh, and I was really, that was the most romantic time in my life with my 16 millimeter camera on my shoulder. Video was not that popular at that time. So I, I made uh, television serials and suddenly Rajiv Gandhi, the prime minister of India got assassinated and I came back to America. And at that time, my road in front of me divided into two parts, one in engineering, one in film. Uh, or, or, or television. So I took the film, so I said, I can always go back to engineering. I, uh, I, I, so I started this company that I still run today. And, and I said to myself, I can always go back to engineering anytime I want, but I'm still running that today after 35 years, that's Teledec. But what I tried to bring to this company uh, was my passion for storytelling, my passion for engagement, engaging the students. And when I was teaching in New York, uh, I was also, I, I, was, I, I don't know if anybody did this before me, uh, I abolished the examination system. I completely flipped the class and I, uh, I, I told my student that you will be uh, assigned homework, but in the class, I will measure, assess your, uh, your, your understanding of the subject by your asking me a question. So I always kept track of every question that they asked and how deep they were into. And, uh, and that's how I started my teaching career. And then I, when I moved to started Teledec, of course, uh, telecom was going through a major innovation at that time. It was going from analog to digital. 
So, and my partner was, had 90 patents in telecommunication. He was also an engineer and a storyteller. So we both started uh, the Teledeck company to really be a telecom training company. And then pretty soon in, in Chicago, major engineering companies came to me and said that, okay, you can, you're the only one who can, who is a film company can read our blueprint, do our manual, do talk to our engineering uh, principals and stakeholders. So why don't you do this technology film? And pretty much it completely uh, overtook the telecom, but I, I Baxter, healthcare companies, Abbott Labs, uh, General Electric, all many, many companies. Uh, I started doing training uh, for them, keeping in mind the passion for storytelling and learner engagement. That's my story. Thank you so much. That's so fascinating. And I, you know, you, you, you uh, pulled that into just a really small nutshell. I imagine you could go on and on and on, but it's, it's really fascinating to see your interdisciplinary background, um, how you tap into, like you said, both the left and right sides of the brain and your passions and your energy and how you melded them together to create really great experiences for students in a university setting, but also uh, for corporations in a training setting. So I, I think that's all wonderful. And I love the idea of storytelling, building that into uh, the training and development space that we might uh, be engaged in, in the HR realm. And one of the things, you know, people who tune into this podcast, they're always wondering about how to better lead their teams, how to navigate the ever shifting landscape of the future of work. And one thing that's very evident is that, uh, we, we have a skills gap, and, and particularly in this tight labor market right now, it's really hard to get highly skilled people, technical skills and STEM skills, but even what, you know, is often called soft skills, um, really the, the EQ and the, the emotional intelligence component of, of running an organization or leading, all of these things, there's a big gap in terms of the skills. And there's just going to be new requirements for the future of work that we haven't even conceived of yet. And so we need to constantly be thinking about how to reskill and to upskill our people with new competencies and capabilities that will help them to be successful in the future of work that will help our organizations and our teams to thrive and to be successful and to innovate and, and continue to add value to the marketplace. And so everything that you're doing uh, in your company, I, I think is a great fit for this conversation. Uh, so next, let's move to this idea of deep learning. I know that's something you talk a lot about. Uh, tell us what that is to you. I have my own ideas about what deep learning is, but how would you define deep learning and why do you feel like it's so important in um, the development of skills, competencies, and capabilities in the future of work? Scientists and uh, medical professionals, neurosurgeons have discovered this for a while now, that the brain has distinctly two compartments, the left side and the right side. And when a patient or somebody gets a stroke uh, in the brain, a cerebral stroke, they call it, when you have the left side of the, of the blood flow stopping in the left side of the brain, your right side gets paralyzed. And when the right side gets uh, attacked uh, your left side. So each side has distinct connection and, and uh, with the, with the with the body and mind. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership. The journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership 
will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. What happens is that when you're learning, there are two types of subjects that people usually learn. One is mathematics, logic, reasoning, law, something that's more cut and dry, formula, equations, uh, examples of, of theories and so forth. That's one side of the brain. Let's say that's the left side. But on the right side of the brain, which is completely the opposite side, is art, literature, creativity, imagination, music, uh, all of those creative energies on another side. This is a very peculiar phenomenon of the way our brain works. Now, deep learning is where uh, I, I, I learned this early on that if you involve both sides of the brain while learning, you get much more mileage out of the, the, of the brain remembering what you just learned. But in, look, in most cases, our education has always been very assessment-based learning. So you study, you memorize, you take a skills test, assessment test, and you pass. And by the time you walk out the door with a certificate in your hand, you've forgotten 70% or 80% of what you just learned. Deep learning is one that stays with you, like swimming, like biking, like driving. Uh, something that involves you personally. So uh, I actually call it, especially now, this topic is so relevant now for us, the learning and development professional, and especially in leadership roles to really decide which path are we going to take? Are we going to stay with the assessment-based skills training where they take a test and then okay, they've learned it, they've got it, or do we have to rethink the design of the learning to really include the deep learning, what I just mentioned? So in my company, from the very early on, from 80s, I have been, just like I said, I have been always insisted on an immersive learning experience where the student have quote unquote, fun learning. For example, if I'm teaching somebody about electrical safety, uh, I would not start with two wires and a pliers and how you stripe it and the electrical meter to look at the amps and the volts and so forth. I will start with a, with, with a jolt to the class with an accident that has happened. Now let's reframe how this accident happened and then go to the root of it. Now I've grabbed their attention, I've hooked them. And, and just like a story in a movie theater, I have gotten their attention. And I always keep telling them in my class that, you know, I'm gonna tell you some stories and if you're not careful, you're gonna learn something. So, so I insist on getting their attention through stories. And the, again, in film school, I learned how to tell a story. There's a beginning, middle and an end. And the storytelling also depends on the instructor, how passionate he is about his delivery, about his energy, about his knowledge, about how much, how desperately he wants his learners to get it. So I think that reflects on the learner's receptiveness of what you're trying to teach them. That's number one, storytelling. And, and deep learning also involved another thing called personalization. So in, every time I design my courses, whether it's online course or, or a classroom a course, I try to personalize the, the content to an extent that I want to measure, I want to make sure that each student has curiosity, has amazement, our intention, their motivation to learn. All of these things are important to me for make sure to the, he's learning. So, uh, so I think I, engagement gives me that. So I built in a lot of hotspots in my 
in my screens, it's a, it's a e learning, and I can measure through my learning management system how many hotspots did you click on and how many downloaded in, uh, how many questions he read for the subject matter expert and so forth. So today's uh, technology allows me to do all of that. Ultimately, we are at a crucial time, uh, uh, Jonathan. Do you remember the perfect storm that happened in Boston? There are three elements that came converged in Boston. And what are those elements? One was the high pressure system, air mass that developed in, in California, Western that merged, that moved toward Boston. Another one, the low pressure system and the cold frigid air from the upper Northwest Canada, uh, Northeast Canada. And it's all con also was flowing toward Boston and a hurricane uh, system, uh, the uh, system that was developed in Florida. All of these three things is very unlikely they all come together. But these three things came together in Boston and became the perfect storm. Many people died, it was a horrible destruction. But in learning and development also, I believe, and I want to say this, and I have many blogs on this subject, that the perfect storm, number one, is, the, uh, is how uh, the millennials are now the audience. Now look at their attention span. Uh, they have, they're used to, unbelievable interactive screens and mobiles and, and, uh, and, and games, game, uh, game stations, PlayStations. So that's the audience is completely changed to what our generation learned from. Our generation was strictly bullets on a PowerPoint and people talk, 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 talk. And that's not happening in today's generation. It, they, they will leave the classroom if they could. And the second element of the perfect storm is technology. Look where the artificial intelligence has taken us, the virtual reality, the augmented reality, the whole technology gives us a new vista in learning that we can employ into the learning method to by involvement. And, and, the, and the third thing is COVID. COVID has enforced distance learning on major corporations. So these three elements is now forcing learning and development stakeholders and decision makers to really rethink, redesign new audience, new technology and distance learning. All of these things has converged. And I believe this is the right time for embark on a new direction for learning and development. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's wonderful. And thank you for your explanation of deep learning. I, I do agree, I think, I think one of the ways I frame deep learning is, you know, of course, getting past the surface level types of learning that you started by describing. And oftentimes that happens through experience. Uh, so ex various forms of experiential learning uh, are really great ways to get into deep learning. Uh, and just ways for people to apply and put into practice what they're learning so they can apply the abstract, the theoretical with the, the, the physical, the actual uh, all of those things can help us with deep learning, and that is essential if we want to truly develop skills, competencies, and capabilities. It's not enough to just take a test and and say, like in our head, we understand something. That that doesn't actually mean much of anything in the workplace. And so we do need to get better at uh, at designing deep learning experiences for students in the university setting, for employees in the workplace, uh, training and development setting. And I really like how you just described this perfect storm uh, in the current uh, labor market, in the current organizational um, context, in terms of how we need to be facing training and development moving into the future. So what do you see, you know, in our final couple minutes that we have together, what do you see as, as really what leaders need to be doing for the future of learning in the next generation? I really believe that leaders have a great opportunity to change the status quo of learning in corporate America. And that status quo is bulleted PowerPoint text in classroom settings, assessment based, based uh, skills examination and certifying them that they're valid. So if you really get away from that, and I what I just explained to you, get yourself uh, is some, some way of establishing connectivity with the audience and understand who they are and what they enjoy doing. Unless they are enjoying, they're motivated, it's fun for them, they're not going to learn anything if you really want to teach them anything at all. 
not just a piece of paper. That's number one. And number two is that get yourself some learning management system that measures, that can be programmed to really monitor the student activity, just like Google does. Every search that you put in your search engine, Google tracks you on everything that you've done. So learning management systems are also capable of tracking your behavior. Behavior, the important thing is behavior, not only skills, but the behavior, the attitude to learn, wanting to learn, that is something that we need to address. And the, and the final thing is that with the VR, with the AR, with the, uh, with the AI, I'm already developing uh, VR based like a simulator training, just like before you start flying a plane, you have to sit in the airport and work in a simulator to fly the plane in thunderstorm and snowstorm or what have you. We really need to adopt VR and AR. Prices have come down, it is not, you know, but you really need to have, you, you as a leader, you have to be motivated to change the status quo. That's, that's really what I feel is the future. Wonderful. Thank you, Kushal. It has been a real pleasure. I know at the time and I need to let you go here in just a minute, but before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your organization, your team, your products, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Well, uh, uh, my uh, website is uh, where it's easy to remember, teledec, T-E-L-E-D-E-C.com. And uh, I have a blog also on that site, uh, slash blog. Uh, and uh, uh, my uh, LinkedIn profile is also something that I, uh, I can, you can easily put Kushal Bose on LinkedIn and see what that is. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, our, uh, I, I would be very happy to converse with anybody who has any kind of a question or any kind of discussion uh, 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 with me. As far as the uh, human capital innovations is concerned, I think if in any way, I, as I mentioned, this perfect storms, we need to really turn to how to make the students want to learn rather than dumping information on them. That complete change uh, is something that we need uh, in our, the future. And I, I, I really think great things because the technology is amazing today. What you can do in a cell phone uh, is amazing. You can learn and from anywhere for any, for any time at on demand, that interactivity, those videos, those uh, immersive learning is the future. Uh, and I, I feel that corporate learning uh, gurus must embrace that. Wonderful. I, I love that word, immersive, immersive learning, deep learning. That's definitely the future. Thank you so much, Kushal, for joining me today. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, find out more about what Kushal and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine 
with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.